Good morning, everybody. It is the hour, Greenwich Mean Time, distributed across the globe, 12 o'clock in Europe, and different time distributions from wherever you might be joining us today. We are just allowing a little time for everyone to, to connect and to sign on. Um, it nonetheless does give me special pleasure this week to be able to welcome you all once again and to welcome in particular those who might have had difficulties accessing this seminar last week. This was apparently due to difficulties with the Zoom platform that it subsequently turned out that half of Europe, but London and the United Kingdom in particular, had been hit by a Zoom outage over the weekend, which would have explained some of the difficulties with the, the video feed and, and with the connectivity. I will mention that audio recordings of all the previous sessions of the seminar are now available on the website of the London Society. Anyone who might have missed any of the previous installments will thus be able to catch up with, via the recordings. And, and you will all be able to listen to any previous seminar as a support for your own ongoing work around this seminar. I also wanted to make a special welcome to our colleagues in India and in Kolkata in particular, who have been dealing with the effects of the recent cyclone that has taken lives, destroyed buildings and infrastructure, and left many people without connection of any kind. All this in the middle of the, the India's severe coronavirus lockdown. I mention this just to to send them, shall we say, our words of support, but also to put into perspective our own localized and connectivity anxieties. So wherever you are and whatever difficulties and anxieties you might be experiencing under your local conditions, it gives me pleasure to welcome you all once more to this next installment of our ongoing work together on Lacan's Seminar 17 the other side of psychoanalysis. Today, with chapter six, The Castrated Master, we arrive at just about the halfway point of the journey of exploration that we have undertaken together. Soon, there will be more stepping stones behind us that than remain for us to traverse. It is a privilege under these conditions for us to be able to make time for this kind of sustained examination of a single seminar, chapter by chapter, week by week, which not only allows for the exploration of each chapter in a bit more detail, but also creates, shall we say, a particular rhythm of reading, giving rise to certain effects of scansion of the text that some of our more habitual modes of working do not necessarily allow for. One of the effects that this has brought into view for me is a certain effect of resignification and reformulation from one chapter to the next, from one week to next, sometimes within the same chapter itself, as Lacan forges ahead with clarifying and reformulating the overlapping stakes of his argument in this seminar. I've also found that this effect of resignification and reformulation is, for me at least, accompanied by a parallel effect of what I might call re enigmatization. Because it turns out that no matter how carefully we might have read the previous chapter, no matter how we might have explored it in detail, when one looks back at some of these previous chapters, from the point where we are at now, we see all kinds of unresolved questions and enigmas proliferating in our wake. 
to the degree that a chapter that we might have explored in great detail at the time, I now find almost closing over itself again in its, in its enigma. This is, of course, something associated with Lacan's own style of teaching, his mode of teaching as a mode of ongoing research, formulating some of the questions posed for him by the real of clinical practice, something that continually escapes symbolic capture. We thus find ourselves almost drawn on in the pursuit of an enigmatic object, this obscure object of desire, that refuses to be pinned down by any master signifier that might allow it to be captured or accumulated as acquired knowledge in the academic sense. Here, perhaps, in relation to the text, we can experience something of the clinical phenomena, shall we say, of the flight of meaning. Also, shall we say, related to this notion of the flight of the hysteric, the hysteric's refusal to be pinned down, to be captured by any established discourse, the discourse of the master. All the devices for the preservation of the enigma, an elusive glimpse of the beauty of a truth behind the veil, behind the masks, those masks that we spoke about last week, while at the same time posing the question of what it is that keeps us engaged in this pursuit. A question, of course, for each one of us to, to answer in their own way. I'm pleased to be able to welcome today's guide in the next installment of this enthralling quest. Bruno de Halle, who is a member of the ECF and the World Association of Psychoanalysis. He was an analyst of the school uh, between 2012 and 2014. He's a psychoanalyst practicing in Brussels and was until recently the therapeutic director of the Antenna 110, a psychoanalytic institute in Belgium for the treatment of children with autism and childhood psychosis. I will take the opportunity also to quickly welcome our discussant today, Neus Carbonell, member of the Spanish School, the ELP, and the World Association, psychoanalyst in Barcelona, where she teaches at the clinical section, and amongst many other activities, is also one of the founders of the TEADIR, an organization for parents and relatives of people with autism. After Bruno's presentation, she will have the role of opening up the discussion with some comments and questions before we then put the discussion to our faithful panel made up of speakers and discussants for the various chapters who have also accompanied us on, on this work and contributed to the discussion. Of course, it is possible for each one of you to formulate your comments and questions either by the chat function or if there is a question and answer function, I don't see it, but via the chat function. You will appreciate that under these conditions, it is not always possible to make room for every question, let alone to promise an answer to them. But we would hope that sometimes the mere formulation of the question has a value for the work, and that if our speakers manage to leave us with more questions than answers, then we will think that they have done a good job of work on our behalf. Bruno, what can you tell us about the castrated master? Thank you, uh, Roger, for this kind introduction. Um, how can we teach what can't be taught? Patricia Tassara said it last week. It's difficult, even impossible, to transmit what is at the earth of psychoanalysis because there is an impossibility to transmit a knowledge proper to the object A. To say it quickly, 
a knowledge which concerns the jouissance. Then what to transmit? I would say I am going to try to respond to the awesome offer made to me by Roger Litton to unfold a chapter of Seminar 17 for its offer put me to work. It aroused a desire, a desire to know, and it is this desire that I hope to be able to transmit today. This chapter, as Roger said, opens the second part of the seminar that Jacques-Alain Miller entitled Beyond the Oedipus Complex. We will see why in this chapter Lacan let us know that the Oedipus is unusable. Even how the Oedipus, the Oedipus complex, is what misleads Freud, what blinds Freud. We find this formulated on page 99, where Lacan says, and why did Freud fall into error? at this point, whereas if my analysis of today is to be believed, he only had to chew over what was being hand-fed to him. Why did he substitute this myth, the Oedipus complex, for the knowledge that he gathered from all these mouths of gold, Anna, Emma, Dora. But before studying this chapter, I have two remarks. The first one is basic, simple. It's a remark on the title of this seminar. The other side of psychoanalysis. What is the other side of psychoanalysis? The other side of psychoanalysis is the Freudian unconscious. The other side of psychoanalysis, the other side of psychoanalytic discourse, is the discourse of the master. And the discourse of the master is the structure of the unconscious. In a course of Jacques-Alain Miller, detached piece, the 12th of January, uh, 2005, Jacques-Alain Miller goes as far as to say that Lacan went around the unconscious in his first 10 seminars. He took, he, he took this discourse proper to the unconscious by all means, and he sees the limits of the unconscious. With seminar 17, he moves on. He is on the way to move from the Freudian symptom, the one that can be deified, to Joyce's symptom. That is to say, to the symptom as a remnant, to the symptom as one must understand it in its dimension of letter and not in its dimension of signification. A second remark before beginning this chapter concerns what makes this seminar so difficult and what makes it so new. With seminar 17, 
the last teaching of Lacan began. As has already been said, the accent in this seminar is put on the effect of jouissance proper to the signifier. This is what makes the seminar both central and at the same time difficult to understand in its complexity. In what is called the first Lacan, in all his early seminars, Lacan highlighted the effect of meaning and the effect of truth of the word, of the signifying chain. But in seminar 17, Lacan changed the deal. He tell us that the signifying chain does not only give an effect of meaning or truth, but that it also produces an effect of jouissance. Until then, the signifier was what annulled the jouissance. From this seminar on, the signifier is to be with, with the jouissance it produces. This passage from annulment to the production of jouissance is very delicate to understand. I have tried to formulate it to introduce this chapter on the castrated master. Lacan develops it from the concept of repetition. It is with this concept of repetition that he identifies the jouissance. As Jacqueline Miller indicated when it was published, repetition is an important key to Seminaire 17. This concept of repetition is at the crossroads of signifier and jouissance, both under the sign of loss and its return. It was Florencia Shanahan who, when she commented upon the third chapter, knowledge, a means of jouissance, pointed out this new unprecedented link between knowledge and jouissance. I take up this articulation briefly because it constitutes the very nut of a new conception of signifier. We find this central passage on page 48 at the bottom of the page. This knowledge here reveals its roots in the fact that in repetition and in the form of the unary trait, to begin with, it is found to be the means of jouissance. Further on in the text, Lacan writes that repetition is the precise denotation of a trait that I have uncovered for you in Freud's text as being identical with the unary trait, with the little stick, with the element of writing, the element of a trait insofar as it is the commemor commemoration of an eruption of jouissance. What is difficult to understand and remains opaque for me is the crossing that is made from the unary trait to jouissance. We find this point to go throughout the seminar. For example, 
page 177. Jouissance is very precisely correlated with the initial form of the entry into play of what I am calling the mark, the unary trait, which is a mark toward death, if you want to give it its meaning. Why does Lacan say that the unary trait is marked toward death? I explain it thus. The unary trait constitutes the first, constitute this first mark that comes to transform, I would say, I would even say to mutate a body that until then was only biological into a signifying body. The body is now caught in the signifying chain. It is mortified by the signifier. So, first point, repetition is not only signifying repetition, it relates to the jouissance as well. I quote, this is our starting point for giving meaning to this inaugural repetition that is repetition directed at jouissance. Lacan says in French, la répétition vise à jouissance. How can we understand this? In what way is repetition directed at jouissance? We must read the following again from page 48. What becomes evident from this formalism is that there is a loss of jouissance. It is at this point in the seminar that Lacan introduces us to the term entropy. Entropy is a term that comes from physics and which expresses a principle of degradation of energy, a loss. Here, Lacan tells us, knowledge that never ceases to work, signifying repetition, produces a loss, a loss of jouissance. Knowledge, the knowledge that works, leads to, implies a loss of jouissance. Lacan writes it in the lower right, page 93, in the formula that Lacan gives to the functions of place. Under the other, it is the place where loss is produced, the loss of jouissance from which we extract the function of surplus jouissance. Alors, I have tried to draw it, and I hope you will see what I have done um, here. Uh, no, like this one. Uh, is it possible? You can read it, or it's in, on the reverse? No, it's just lovely. We, we see it very, very well. If you can show us again and give us ah, a moment okay. to, to, That's to fine. see it. You see the place of the loss of jouissance from which we extract the function of surplus jouissance. So, there is a loss. That is the product of knowledge at work. And this loss will be compensated, and that's important, to, uh, to, to have in, in uh, head. I quote, and it is in the place of this loss introduced by repetition that we see the function of the lost object emerge. 
of what I am calling the object A. This concept of repetition, as I said, is central. It's double. There is, on one hand, on the one hand, the signifying repetition as such, I would say pure repetition. And on the other hand, the repetition that is directed at jouissance. Lacan gave us an example to understand this distinction. It's an example that he has do that has to do with energetics. When one in the field of the signifier and only of the signifier, from the point of a view of a pure signifying calculation, a weight of 80 kilos descending 500 meters and then going back up to the same starting point, Lacan says it's zero, no work. But if the signifier is introduced as an apparatus of jouissance, descending 500 meters with a weight of 80 kilos on your back, and once you have descended, going back up the 500 meters, it becomes obvious that there has been work that you don't return to the starting zero. There is entropy, a loss. We are thus in the field of jouissance. Frank Relier reminded us a fortnight ago that this seminar 17 is correlative to the fifth paradigm that Jacques-Alain Miller produced in its reference text on the paradigms of jouissance. It is translated in English. In French, we find this text in La Cause Freudienne, number 43. Jacques-Alain Miller tells us that in the past, repetition was always necessary for its signifying representation. But with Seminar 17, repetition is in a different register. The whole seminar of the other side of psychoanalysis is made to show the repetition necessitated as by jouissance. In this seminar, the emphasis is placed both on the signifier as a mark of jouissance. Lacan say that the signifier commemorates an eruption of jouissance. And at the same time, it introduces a loss of jouissance and produces a supplement of jouissance. Um, just, a, how do you say, a parenthèse, I want to, to thank a lot of, uh, Philip Drivers who helped me to create a lot of things and to see uh, some translation in English who are not exactly the same as Lacan, as I have understood them in the paradigm of jouissance. So there's a little bit difference in what, what I say and what you will find in the text of, in English. So, now I open chapter four, chapter six, The Castrated Mester. Oedipus and his beyond. The first sentence of the chapter is my first introductory remarks. It must be beginning to dawn on you that the other side of psychoanalysis is the very thing that I am putting forward this year under the title of Master's Discourse. That's the first sentence. To say the other side of psychoanalysis is to indicate that we are in the Master Discourse. 
the master's discourse is the discourse of the unconscious. And the discourse of the unconscious is the one that Freud invented, developed, made more complex. The logic of this discourse of the unconscious is that of the Oedipus. That is to say, a logic that responds to the formulas of sexuation on the masculine side. I briefly recall the formulas without commenting on them. Formulas found in the seminar Encore, the 20th. For on one side, the masculine formulas for all X, phi the X. Oh, I have it here. I think so. Yes. I know. Like that? Yes. Um, for all X, phi the X, and this formula is completed by an existence that denies the phallic function. There is one X as non feed X. And in the other side, the, we found the feminine formulas. Uh, I have it too here. Uh, it doesn't exist an X, uh, no feed X, and not for all X, feed X. Uh, yes. Yes, thanks, okay. brother. Okay. I said at the beginning of this intervention that the Oedipus complex is what misleads Freud, what blinds Freud. <coughs> Freud is blinded because he is stuck on the Oedipus. In order to give an understanding of feminine jouissance, he stops there. He limits himself to the Oedipal mechanics, to these mechanics that resolve and thereby annuls the whole of jouissance in the signifying machine. Freud, in a way, blinded himself, even though, even though the hysterics allowed him to discover psychoanalysis. He clung to the theory, to the Oedipal complex, and gave up listening to the hysteric in the beyond that they indicated in relation to the function of the father. This is why we can understand in the second part of Lacan's teaching that there is in a certain way, a uh, Lacan against Freud. In one of his courses, the, called The Question of Madrid, Jacques Miller tells us that it is as if Freud had asked that the logic of psychoanalysis demanded that the aporia summarized by the object A be resolved by the way of the Oedipus. And as if Lacan himself had continued along the way of confronting petit little a, even if it mean having to dissolve the Oedipus. Or to say it with Jacques Miller, to go beyond the Oedipus. Freud's Oedipus, in a certain way, goes against psychoanalysis because Freud's discovery of psychoanalysis limited to Oedipal logic alone, Freud's discovery, Freud's discovery comes to crash on the rock of the castration. In the chapter on the castrated master that I am commenting today, Lacan tells us that the Oedipus played for Freud the role of knowledge, 
with a claim to truth. That is to say, knowledge that is located in the figure of the analyst discourse in the sight of what just before I was calling the sight of truth. I have a drawing for you and I give you here. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Here. Voila. You see, on this side, there is the sight of truth. And here, it's the knowledge. That's the schema of the analyst's discourse. Yes, 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 yes. yes. With knowledge and the sight of truth. Mm -hmm. Alors, um, uh, I've worked a lot about the hysteric subject. The hysteric reveals the truth of the master. How to understand that? Lacan indicates in his Italian note, Freud loves with the truth. Freud took hysteric seriously. He believed them. And it is thanks to the hysteric that he ended up inventing the Oedipus and the function of the father. And in this seminar, Lacan takes up again the question of hysteria in order to make a discourse that comes to animate the master in a certain way. On page 94, he says, it's simply that the hysterics discourse reveals the master's discourses relation to jouissance in the sense that in it, knowledge occupies the place of jouissance. I give you the drawing here. Uh, here, you see the, know, the, the, the knowledge, it was Bruno, in the Bruno, of the master. can you hold oh, it yes. just a little bit higher into the screen? Yes, Thank I'm you. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's fine. The, the, the knowledge was in the discourse of the master, the place of jouissance. The second part of the chapter is devoted to hysteria and specifically to the Dora case. Once again, Lacan revisits the case in order to get a lesson from it. What does Lacan bring that is new in his revisiting, revisiting the case of Dora in this seminar? Lacan proposes here an hypothesis that he will demonstrate and which is the opposite of Freud's. In this chapter, where Lacan takes up again the case of Dora, he demonstrates that if the father is the one who holds the organ, it only takes on its value by being castrated. I'm not going to take up the case exhaustively, but I quickly unfold the four-part quartet discussed by Lacan many times in the play between Dora, her father, Mrs. K, and Mr. K. I will read quickly the case of Dora in the light of an enlightening comment by Pierre Navot, published in Quarto. Uh, it's published in Belgium, 48-49, under the title, The Hysteric and Her Father. First movement, the hysterical subject is made through the discourse the most precious good the, masters, the master desires. She arranges to arouse the master desire. She puts the master 
on a pedestal. She wants to seduce the master. And this is written uh, by S to S1 here, I think, yes, here. The hysteric wants to seduce the master. <clears throat> she wants the master to be animated by a desire, by a desire to know. She asks him the question of uh, her being, who am I? And in doing so, she sets him in motion. She takes him out of his position of master in place of agent. It is necessary to recall then that in the first chapter, production of the four discourses, Lacan reminds us a precious indication about the master. He raised the question of whether a master is animated by a desire to know. You find that page 24. Does the master want to know? Does he have the desire to know? And Lacan replies, a real master, as in general we used to see until a recent era, and this is seen less and less, a real master doesn't desire to know anything at all. He desires that things work. The master wants that things work and that the knowledge on, is on the side of the slave. However, Lacan specifies earlier in the text, we can observe that then that historically, the master has, has slowly defrauded the slave of his knowledge and turned it into the master knowledge. But what remains a mystery, continues Lacan, is how the desire to do, to do this could have arisen for him. Uh, that you find that uh, page 34. And we find the answer in chapter six. The master frustrates, frustrates the slave with his knowledge by means of hysteria. The hysterical subject arouses the master desires. She, make, she makes herself the object of his desire. She put the master to the work of knowing. She takes in a certain way the place of the master, but she does not incarnate the master for all that. She is as barred, she is divided by the question of what is the price of her being here in the hysterical discourse as object A. The second movement is set in details in, on page 94. She is in solidarity with this father. She has seduced the master. But in the same movement, it is to make herself immediately deprived of him. She evades in her capacity as object of desire. The hysteric, the hysteric subject unmask, however, the master's function with which she remains united by 
emphasizing what there is of master. And she superimposes this master on the father she idealizes. The question of what the hysteric wants is formulated later in the seminar. She wants a master. This is absolutely clear. She wants the other to be a master and to know lots of things. But at the same time, she doesn't want him to know so much that he does not believe she is the supreme prize of all his knowledge. In other words, she wants a master she can reign over, she reigns and he does not govern. Lacan starts from the fact that Dora's father, the pivotal point of the entire adventure or misadventure, is strictly a castrated man. I mean, as concerns his sexual potency. It is obvious, says Lacan, that he has had it, that he is quite unwell. In a curious way, Lacan brings Mr. K to us as the third man of the quartet. The question then arises as to who is the second man beside the father. Mr. K is convenient for Dora because she has the idea that he has the organ. Thus far, Freud gets it. So what's the difference between Freud's reading of the case and Lacan's reading of it in this seminar? Freud, Lacan tells us, is blinded by his prejudices. Following his conception of the Oedipus, he has the idea that Dora is interested in the organ proposed to her by Mr. K. For Freud, the male organ is metaphorized by the jewel. And the jewel box is a metaphor of the female sex. Freud's interpretation would be this. Dora's jewelry box is ready to open to serve as receptacle for Mr. K's jewel. Metaphorically speaking, Dora wants Mr. K's jewel in exchange for which she could give her jewelry box. Freud says to her, the dreams confirms that you are awakening your old love for your father to defend yourself against your love for Mr. K. But more than that, you fear yourself and you fear the temptation to give in to him. You thus confirm the intensity of your love for him. Dora disagrees with this interpretation. She protests. And Lacan interprets the dreams differently. He takes note of Dora's disagreements and he opposes Freud's interpretation. Lacan maintains that she does not want the jewel of Mr. K to come in the jewelry box of Dora. The jouissance in this case, the jouissance of the phallus, is precisely what Dora does not want. 
What interests the Ra? It's not the jewel. It's the jewelry box, says Lacan. She only enjoys the container, the box, the envelope of the precious organ. She does not want the jouissance of the phallus as such. The subjective position of the hysteric can be read as follows. The jewel box, she has it in the sense that, what, that it is what she enjoys. And the jewel, she is. Dora enjoys the empty box. Thus, the hysterical subject identifies with a subjective position that is such that for her jouissance of the phallus is excluded. The jouissance that counts, the only jouissance that counts for Dora, for the hysterical subject, is the jouissance of privation. This subjective position is made possible to her if the master is castrated. This is what she never ceases to achieve. In other words, it is to highlight another function attached to the father, a function that will be read in the historical subject discourse. What interests the historical subject when she places the father in the position of master is to bring out his repressed truth. This father, this father whom the hysterical subject idealizes, whom the hysterical subject takes as his master, this loved father, this idealized father, is in fact a castrated father. What the hysterical subject wants, Lacan insists on this, is knowledge of the truth, of the truth of the master insofar as he castrated. The hysterical subject, here though, does not want the jouissance of the organ offered to her by Mr. K. The jewel of Mr. K could go and lodge itself elsewhere, says Lacan. Such is Dora's position. But what does the hysterical subject want? There is an answer on page 97. What Dora wants, I quote, what she wants is knowledge as the means of jouissance. But in order to place this knowledge in the service of truth, the truth of the master that she embodies as Dora. Dora refuses the jouissance of the organ offered by, to her by Mr. K. Her subjective position is one in which, for her, the jouissance of the phallus is excluded. On this point, Freud stumbled. What interests Dora, what is at the earth of her jouissance, was not the phallus, the phallus of Mr. K, but it was knowledge. Knowledge as it produces a loss of jouissance. Knowledge as it signals that the master is castrated. Dora addresses the master knowledge, but as soon as the master responds to this desire, it is to dismiss the master in the time after. I didn't take the second dream of the case of Dora, but it speaks about the research of knowing. Um, Vicente Palamera made a valuable comment last week on the work of Patricia Tassara, indicating that in the end, it is not so much the father who has a function of castration, 
but it is the signifier, the language as such. This is what Lacan will develop in the following chapters, where Lacan demonstrates that this Freudian father who forbids jouissance, this father of the Oedipus, is in fact only a castrated father, a semblance, destined to cover the will at stake, the loss of jouissance, is a matter of language. We find this point at the end of the following chapter where Lacan concludes that the important thing to understand in castration is not so much the murder of the father, this is what Freud argued with the myth of Oedipus, but that castration is a matter which concerns the effect of the signifiers and the truth. I quote at the end of the next chapter, the chapter seven, at the end. What's important is that Oedipus was admitted to Jocasta's side because he had triumphed, triumphed at a trial of truth. And then, if Oedipus comes to a very sticky end, it's because he absolutely wanted to know the truth. Well, I'm going to finish on a development that Lacan brings to the end of the chapter, where Lacan once again insists on what blinded Freud in the function of the father. I reread the last of the new lectures on psychoanalysis, where Freud thinks that psychoanalysis plays a decisive role in the rejection, once for all, of religion. Freud's demonstration is this. At the origin, the religious feeling comes from the unconditional love that the child has for the father, for the father whom he idealizes and overestimates. Once he has become an adult, the subject has recognized that the father is a being limited in its power. And this is why he substitutes the image kept in memory of the father of the childish age. He elevates, he elevates him to the rank of divinity and inserts him, Freud tells us, in the present and in reality. The emotional strength of this image of memory and the persistence of his need for protection together support his, his belief in God. Freud preserves, Lacan tells us, the idea of a father who is all love. Even in the midst of totem and taboo, which he will bring up in the next chapter, the original father is the one whom the sons killed, after which it is from the love of the dead father that a certain order proceeds. This myth and Freud's choice of the Oedipus conceal a truth. What is concealed? Well, to put it in my words, what is concealed is the other side of the master's discourse, the other side of the unconscious discourse, the experience of the hysteric, the fact of having listened to them, should have prevented Freud from blinding himself with his myth of the Oedipus. 
he could have gone beyond the Oedipus and discovered firstly that putting knowledge to works sets the master in motion and secondly that it was necessary to be able to situate this knowledge in the position of truth so that a different discourse could emerge. The analyst discourse could have introduced Freud to the dimension of the beyond of the Oedipus. The dimension can be read in the formulas of the situation on the feminine side. A woman is related to the phallus, but not only. It also has to do with the S de Grand Tabaret, S from Big Other Bard. The, the signifier of the Bard Other. Thank you, Roger. It has also do with that, with something enigmatic, with another jouissance, a jouissance of which a woman can say nothing and of which nothing can be said. I have written to, for you and I have finished on that place. You see the phallus place and the other enigmatic uh, S de Grand Tabaret. <laughs> Bruno, I'm not quite sure how to thank you personally, but on behalf of everyone, I think, who's had the privilege of listening to your careful and meticulous reading, how you've, you've taken the care to take us not just through the argument of this chapter, and some of the logic of the clinic of hysteria, but also the work that you've put into linking the argument of this chapter to some of the questions that we had encountered previously in our work. Mm -hmm. And even as a bonus, shall we say, throwing open some questions towards the next chapters, mm -hmm. and not just towards the next chapters, but all the way towards seminar 20. So I, I, I think we have been privileged to, 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 be, uh, to be able to hear your work of, let's put it this way, uh, write, reading something of the writing of something about which nothing can be said and finding a way to transmit something of that, which I think is a great achievement for which I thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I think if Naos Carbonell has something that she wishes to say in relation to this chapter or questions that she wants to put to, to Bruno. Now we can proceed like that and then see where the discussion takes us. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Um, well, uh, I also want to thank uh, Bruno Dalle for this uh, very clear and thorough presentation on chapter six. I uh, agree uh, very much uh, on the emphasis that uh, Bruno put on the fact that this seminar uh, may marks a break, a change of direction uh, in Lacan's teaching, and it constitutes the beginning of what uh, Jacqueline Muller uh, has named or called the last Lacan. Um, maybe uh, we can go as far as stating, I don't know that if you would agree with that, that the construction of the analyst discourse as the reversal of the master's discourse, as well as the place given to jouissance in relation to truth and knowledge, inaugurates a different era in psychoanalysis. Uh, I think that this is an aspect that uh, was uh, very well argued in your presentation today. I have, I have three questions, if I may put them. Yeah, okay, I have of three course, questions. Please. Yes. Okay. Uh, the first question uh, is, uh, it concerns the relation between knowledge and Jewish sense that runs throughout all the seminar. 
but uh, in this seminar, uh, sorry, in this chapter, something became quite clear to me, especially after listening to the questions that uh, Bruno put forward. Um, the, the analyst discourse is the reversal of the master's discourse. And this is written in the formulas of the four discourses. So in this sense, knowledge and jouissance are in opposite sides of the written equation in each case. And in page 106 uh, of this chapter, we read, this is a quote by Lacan, in the discourse of the master, the subject finds himself along with all the illusions that this comprises, bound to the master signifier, whereas knowledge brings about his insertion in Jewish So in the master's discourse, it is by means of knowledge that the subject is inserted in Jewish Whereas in the analyst discourse, we find something quite different. The surplus of Jewish is the agent and knowledge is in the place of truth. Then if we go back to chapter three, the last paragraph, we find this quote. It says, it is to the analyst and to him alone that this formula I have so often commented on, this who is var sol is werden, it is addressed. It is the analyst, if the analyst tries to occupy this place, which determines the discourse on the top left, he is absolutely not there for himself. It is here where the surplus jouissance, the other jouissance was, that I, as preferring the psychoanalytic act, must become. So my question is, do you think that Lacan proposes a new reading of the Freudian phrase? Somehow, Lacan seems to state that the position of the analyst is rooted, if I may say so, in the object A as a semblance. This may shed light on the question uh, that you formulated at the end. What kind of transmission is possible about the object A? The enunciation of the analyst takes it, its agency not from the master signifier, but from the object A. Do you think that this can give us a hint about how knowledge about the object A can be transmitted? This would be my first question. The other two questions will be shorter. Let's, let's take that first question. That first question gives us plenty to work with, but, but, okay. but thank you for, for your, meticulous quest, uh, your, your meticulous question, which matches the meticulous work that Bruno has already put in. Bruno, what can you tell us around that question, that question of the roots of knowledge in Jewish Yes, it's a, a very complex question and very nice question because it's ask uh, how to understand the knowledge when the knowledge in the discourse of the analyst is in the place of truth. That's the difficulty, how to understand that. It's not the same when the knowledge is in the discourse of the university at the place of the agent, of course. It's completely different. So um, when you uh, bring this nice reference to wo es war soll ich werden, you say that it's not for himself uh, it's um, you you talk about enunciation of the analyst you talk about the psychoanalytical act and then the question is that uh, what how to understand uh, the discourse of the analyst where the place of the agent is occupied by the semblance of little a. And it's important to, you have told that it's a semblance and not the object a. Because if it was the object a, it would be another relation 
the same as Lacan gave us to Kant uh, with Saad, uh, uh, perversion relation. It's just a semblance. And, um, and I, I'm sure um, it gave us a hint. Uh, but the hint is to understand with what with something who is not um, uh, understandable immediately. It concerns, I think, the enunciation, the style of the, the analyst, uh, the fact that uh, this no, knowledge in place of truth uh, is completely separated from the signifiers, from the master signifiers uh, of the subject. And then I guess it gives, um, um, yes, as you say, a hint, a hint to be transmitted. I can give you a little example because I'm not very clear. Uh, you, you know, when I, uh, went in other countries to speak about my experience as a director therapeutic of Antenna Sandis uh, 110, uh, the center of autistic children. It was very difficult to transmit something else that what I can say about or practice. There is always something who is sealed, who is uh, impossible to transmit. And I think that something was transmittable because of my, uh, because of the way I was, uh, how do you say, traversé par, uh, I was uh, touched. Traversed by, crossed by, uh, crossed crossed by tra yes. traversed by. Yeah. Yes, crossed by the clinic with the children autistic and also by my analysis. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's uh, in all the lectures I give uh, about the antenna sandis and the practice of plusieurs. Uh, it was more the style than uh, the that the what I have said. That the it's speech. Not very clear. No, no. <laughs> you have an idea. No, I, I thought you were very clear. You answered it uh, very clearly. Mm -hmm. It's more the style than the speech itself. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, um, the I I remember that. Uh, each analyst is um, uh, without comparison with another. There is no way to be analyst. Each analyst is analyst in its own and singular way. And uh, when he has achieved at the end of, the anal of his analysis, this absolute uh, particularity of his being, then something I think can be done in the psychoanalysis cure, but also when he tried to transmit something because as Jacques Miller told us very often, each time, each Wednesday when he comes and gives his lessons, his, uh, he says, I am in the place of the analysant. Uh, the teaching is at this place. Voilà. <laughs> Naos, you had another couple of questions lined up. Um, a, a shorter one. <laughs> uh, it's about the question of uh, the feminine injury sound. Uh, that uh, in this seminar, it takes a new path. And I appreciate very much how uh, Bruno has brought in all the uh, formulas of uh, sexuation uh, and how uh, Bruno has made very clear that in this chapter or in this seminar especially 
for Lacan, the Oedipus cannot account for feminine sexuality. And my question would be, the way you've, ex the way you've explained uh, the, 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 uh, the Doris case uh, in this seminar, has uh, made me think that perhaps, I don't know if you would agree with that, Bruno, if perhaps we could say that the hysteric is an effort to do with jouissance as surplus within the regime of the father. This would be uh, a question. Yes, it's well, well said. I agree completely with that. And um, uh, when I, I work on this chapter, uh, Neus, I, I was thinking that Lacan is very severe with Freud. <laughs> because, uh, of course, we can say that, uh, in, a, in a way, uh, that Freud has because of his idea, a priori, his first idea of Oedipus complexes, he has not seen the other jouissance that Lacan gave us to the feminine jouissance. And he has only the idea that a woman once uh, is under the Oedipus complex and she wants the phallus of the father and be, because she cannot have it, then she wants a baby and it's a substitution between uh, one and the other. But uh, in fact, I don't know your idea of that, of other, other uh, teachers here. Um, Freud uh, has a humility too, because he says in the text uh, about uh, feminine sexuality, uh, uh, that he has a dark continent, that he, do, he doesn't understand anything. And so it's, it's a way to tell us that he has the idea that there is something he, he didn't mm. cut, he didn't uh, and, uh, catch, madam. <laughs> I don't know. Um, so uh, your question is, is nice, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, that's why I try to explain what is what missed Freud with Dora. He missed that the the earth of the jouissance of Dora was not uh, what he thinks, but was another thing. Lacan tell here, tells us here is the privation of jouissance. It's a way of saying the feminine uh, jouissance, but I think that uh, we must understand that often. Uh, it's a complete enigma. She wants, she wants something. What? I don't know, <laughs> but she wants <laughs> is there, is there something like that. And then you have to take one by, by one. Um, <laughs> bon. um, Speaking too quick. I'm sorry. <laughs> that, that's okay. Taking them one by one is is how we will do it. We're taking the questions one by one. And Neos, you 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 had another one. Yes, but I don't know if someone wants to ask something else. I have another one, but. Um... Well, if you would like a break from them, maybe Bruno would just like. A, 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 I know Gustavo has a comment that he wants to make, and then we can come back to your to, to your question if if there's a moment. Now, Gustavo, yes. if you'd like to unmute yourself. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we yes. can. Uh, Bruno, hello. Good morning. It's a real pleasure to see you again after so many years. Uh, I have two questions, uh, but you can choose just one. Hmm? The one you prefer. The first one that um, if is there anything that has changed nowadays regarding the hysteria? I mean that is it still a general truth that the hysteric refuses the jouissance of phallus? This is the first one, and the general second, truth, a universal truth. Yeah, a general truth for hysteria. Hmm? 
Yes, yes, yes. yes. Okay. And the second one is, until which point can the subject, at least on the field of neurosis, and especially at the beginning of the analytical experience, uh, until which point can he deconstruct his life without the resource of the Oedipical narrative? Typical narrative. Yeah. Oh yes, okay. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <coughs> mm. I'm not sure. Um, I, I take the first one. Um, yes. It certainly has changed because the characteristic of the hysteric subject is that uh, what is he doing today must be completely different than what he has done yesterday. So each day must be completely different, always. <laughs> and uh, so, um, yes. I, um, but uh, perhaps I, I have no idea on which orientation we can we can take or what has changed completely. Um, perhaps with the world of today, I, I'm thinking about a case who I see. It's not a psychoanalysis, but it's a case of a man with three daughters and a mother and when the daughter are 12 14 and 16 suddenly they accuse her father her loved father of abusing them since always and the father ask me, but what can I do? <laughs> That's incredible. So uh, perhaps uh, uh, in, in, in this world, uh, I don't know, but uh, there is something like, because the father is nothing, absolutely nothing, like until that's already in the seminar, uh, he has not all the women in the world, only one, and even with one, it's difficult. And this father, who has been very loving for her daughters, what was happening for him with those three girls who are now the most extremely uh, feminist figures that I have ever heard? I don't see the daughters, I see only the, the man who asked me, but what can I do? So perhaps it's a figure of, of a new <laughs> history. I don't know. What do you think? I, I, Gustavo, you are still muted, but, but, but I'm hoping, Gustavo, that you might actually elaborate your question for us a little bit. Um, because a, a, as I follow it, that question about possible changes in the contemporary structure of hysteria yes. in relation to the question of phallic jouissance in particular Oh. Would that be something played out between, shall we say, what we might call broadly the feminization of the world on the side of the logic of the not all oh. and some kind of relation to new forms of virilization, which, shall we say, women are not uh, freed of? Yes. Is that what you were trying to get at with that question about the relation to, to phallic jurisance in particular? I, I think that my question is just more simple <laughs> than that. Even more simple. Nowadays, we find, we see many cases of hysteria uh, of women who do not refuse the phallic jurisance and at the same time, we can consider them, the logic of their subjectivity is hysteric. Ah. 
Mm. Yes, but is there not something else concerning phallus that they reject? <laughs> not only the phallic organ. Yes. <clears throat> mm -hmm. What's your idea? <laughs> no, no, I, I, I think, that, of course, there is always something that they will reject. Mm -hmm. But I think that something has changed in the sense that it's not exactly, or not only, in all cases, the phallic reasons that they will refuse. Yes, yes, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, that's right, I'm sure. Now, unless any of our other panelists want to make a comment or intervene, which of course you are all free to do as you see fit, we might Dr. revert. Yes? Yes. Uh, Florence. Florence, yes, please. Um, I'm very interested in this um, question um, because I think it's a. Uh, it's very useful to read this seminar, um, keeping in mind the uh, uh, keeping in mind the um, ways of reading uh, departing from our um, moment, let's say our epoch. Mm -hmm. And I'm reminded of Lacan's uh, question in, in 1977 um, when he asked, where, where are the hysterics of today? Um, it's a text that is published in psychoanalytic notebooks for those who want um, to, to visit it. Mm -hmm. But That's in right. relation to what, to what Gustavo says, I, I do have the idea that it's very different if we uh, approach hysteria understood from the logic of a strategy of desire hmm, and the relationship to uh, the other from the perspective of desire, let's say the clinic of the question, than if we approach it from what Bruno situated as the turn in Lacan's teaching uh, towards the fields of jouissance. And effectively, there is uh, something of in the presentation of what do we understand by means of, uh, what, what do we, we understand phallic jouissance is when it's not uh that which is just framed by the logic of the oedipus we could say that phallic jouissance is uh, or let's say the relationship of the bodies it's uh, not necessarily exactly the same uh, let's say in, in Lacan in the in the Congress on Feminine Sexuality and later on. So just to maybe leave that open for research for us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, we, we do so have the... May, may I add one little thing? Please, Patricia. Uh, uh, thank you, Roger. Uh, I, uh, I agree with with what uh, Florencia just said. I think that Lacan returned to hysteria in his late teaching, and I, I after listening to Florencia, I uh, remembered he made a comment about Helen Sisu, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, talking about the rigid hysteria. Hmm? which uh, I remember once Eric Laurent came to Barcelona and I made him this same question. Uh, he said, we don't have to be too rigid ourselves, uh, trying to situate uh, hysteria as rigid hysteria, etc. Hmm? But to use these this, uh, sort of new concepts or ideas, 
to to in our investigations but um the point to from my point of view the the question is how to can we think hysteria today without the father mm -hmm. so maybe just just to add this little thing thank you roger sorry thank you thank you patricia um i see that susanna hula has her her digital palm raised susanna if you would like to add something i wanted to say that i i like very much your exposition bruno very very clear about your comment that lacan is very uh, tough of Freud. I remember that in the seminar of 1998, Miller said that uh, only when uh, Lacan put together uh, the signifier with Jusans, he achieved the discoveries of Freud in the seventh chapter of the Tramdeutung meaning that he is in a way uh, criticizing Lacan and saying how much uh, took for Lacan to come to Freud. He's coming back to Freud took time. Mm -hmm. uh, and he said that the assertion that knowledge is a mean of uh, jouissance uh, is a, in, a in effect, uh, it's like a translation of the seventh chapter of the Trime Dolton. Uh, another comment, uh, Neus asked uh, whether the Zoll, um, is a new conception or a new reading of the phrase. Uh, maybe, I, I think uh, uh, it is coherent what other things that Lacan says about the Zoll Verden, uh, because when we think about the analyst um, provoking a kind of event in the body of the analysant it's 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 something that has to do with uh, putting the ich of the analyst the ich that provokes the act the ich of the act um, in the logic of of the drive when we talk about ejaculation, um, it's, uh, it's acting in the logic of the drive and less in the logic of um, the chain of signifiers. That's it. Thank you, Susanna. Now, Naos, I know we, when we were taking your questions one by one, there was one to come. Would you like to, to add and elaborate that question for us? Sure. If I would like to add something mm -hmm. uh, about uh, the, the debate that has been taking place just now, and uh, listening to Gustavo and Florencia and Patricia and Bruno, it uh, dawned on me that uh, if something is new about the hysteria nowadays, is that the truth that the hysteria wants to unveil or wants to reveal, that is that the master is castrated, is an obvious truth. Yes, that's right. Uh, yes. So um, maybe uh, we could uh, take, uh, you know, the the the, invest, the the research that Florencia was saying also from from this point of view, and also um, this um, in the Congress uh, on Congress on Feminine Sexuality, um, Lacan talks about feminine sexuality as an effort, as an effort to inscribe desire in this conti in what he then calls the contiguity of Jewish sons, of uh, Jewish sons enveloped in her own body, something along those lines. And that's why I thought that the way that Bruno read uh, today Dora's case was, was going a little bit on the same lines, like this effort of the hysteric to inscribe desire in, within these surplus of of uh, jouissance. Mm, that's 
what I thought that's what's what's behind my mind in the question that I, I put before. And the other question I had was um, about the um, something that Bruno said that um, to me was uh, very enlightening was that in this in this chapter the relationship between the unary trait and Jewish science um, remains opaque. And I I thought that uh, maybe it's the beginning of a, if this is if it is maybe it is opaque to because it's difficult still to Lacan himself and uh, it's. Perhaps, I don't know, this is a question I have, that in Seminar 19, when he starts uh, talking of the one, Jewish sons is the one of Jewish sons, and the expression, you know, Yadelan, uh, if maybe uh, then he can um, clarify something about the relationship between the one and Jewish sons, that in this seminar, he's perhaps uh, looking for, but not quite uh, finding yet. Uh, this is uh, what came to my mind at this point, because it's true, it's very opaque, the relationship between the unary trait and, and Jewish science, uh, uh, not very logically ex uh, explained the way Lacan is always so, so logic. This is uh, the last question and I, I had after listening to what Bruno had to say to us today. It's, it's all the way uh, from Lacan teaching in the seminar of the, in the identification, where Lacan, I think it's in, in this seminar, uh, explain as what is the trait, the unary trait, and, um, and what you are telling, uh, Neus, it's very interesting, Yadela, Yadela, it's it's so um, it seems to be easy to understand, but it's not. It's all my clinic with the autistic children, because the autistic children they are in a way only in the S one. There is never an S two, but it's so difficult to 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 catch that. So uh, I'm sure that you're right. The last teaching of Lacan about Yadlin separated completely of the other, uh, and all the accent of interpretation of all the concepts of Lacan are uh, developed with the only one, uh, the, I, I think, about the symptoms of uh, Joyce. Mm -hmm. And um, yes, so I, I'm sure there is a, a way to to learn between uh, uh, the unary traits and Yadolin. <laughs> um, Bruno, thank you. Neos, thank you also for your questions, which, if nothing else, have brought us to the point of one obvious truth. It, it wasn't so clear that we were going to even be able to locate one obvious truth in this seminar. And you have brought us to the point of formulating the one obvious truth, the castration of the master in the clinic of hysteria. Mm -hmm. This certainly gives us some a, a pointer to take us to next week, to next week's chapter, which will deal with Oedipus, Moses, and the father of the horde, when we will be privileged to have Alexander Stevens presenting the chapter and with questions and comments by Rick Luser. Thank you most of all for Bruno de Halle for giving us a, a milestone of a presentation along our way, and for all of you for being part of our work, our construction of the attempt to transmit something about what it is that can't always be said. We look forward to seeing you again next week. Thank you very much, all of you. Bye-bye. <laughs>